I have no disclosures. Let me just start you right at the begin uh, about a hundred years ago. Just show this. Can we have some uh, sound on this? Here we go. This is the first Bovi machine ever used. No flame needed. But does it make toast? Very good. Get it off! Get it off! This is not Greek tragedy. This actually happened 50 years later in an operating room where a nurse got electrocuted by faulty current. Um, and although we don't see those things necessarily today anymore, there are still c fires happening at a pretty high rate. And I'll talk to you about why they occur, what to do about it, and how to prevent them. Historically, we always knew about the risk. You know, we work in an environment where everything burns. We use ether, ethyl chloride, cyclopropane, and fluoroxine, and we, we are ready to ignite a fire at a drop of a head. And uh, we work with oxygen-enriched environments. We have ignition sources, alcohol prepping agents, poor recognition of risk by clinician. We really don't have any collaboration between the stakeholders and no technological remedies. If you thought fire retardant materials exist in the operating room, they don't. So 200 to 350 cases per year today, that's still five to 10 people dying every year unnecessarily and many people being uh, disfigured for life. Most are minor injuries. And just to look at one database from Pens Pennsylvania, you can basically uh, count on one ore fire for every 200 cases done. Now, 200 cases sounds like a lot, but in, in California alone, in our Kaiser system, we do uh, close to a million every year. When we look at statistics where they occur, as one might expect, most of them are in the upper airway area, head, neck, face, and upper chest. And as we would expect, the ignition sources are what we use every day, monopolar devices, and then some lasers, other equipment, fiber optic-like source become a big problem today because most of what we do is laparoscopic. When do fires occur? Well, there are a bunch of reasons mostly uh, related to what type of surgery we do, facial surgery, carotid endarterectomy, tracheostomies, oral surgery, tonsillectomies, but also pneumonectomies, conization, hernias in infants, circumcisions, C-sections, pacemakers, you name it. The risk is everywhere. So a couple of misconceptions here to cure. There are no fire retardant uh, things that we use doesn't exist, technology doesn't exist. Betadine skin prep is flammable? No. So there is actually something that we can use that is not flammable. And is it important to get a fire extinguisher first to the fight the fire? Really no. As we learned earlier in the fuse session, fire extinguishers are rarely needed for operating fire. And despite what you're being told by the manufacturers, Lanugo hair is not highly flammable in air. Let's, let's go through a typical case report. You know, minor facial surgery, aqua-based prep. We have nasal prongs of O2. Who knows how much uh, percentage O2 that means at two liters? It's more than 30%, okay? Full close rate, and we observe a spark. A spark we observe when we use high voltage energy. So if you're in a coag mode and you do the surgery, this is what's gonna happen. And this is the result long term. And it's gonna be on the newspapers. There are uh, lawyers specializing on, on burns in the operating room and you will get a call. 
This is a claim study from the SA, 103 closed claims, 90% the ignition was electro uh, surgical device, 85% in the head and neck, 84% had o any type of open oxygen source, and 20% permanent disability or death. That should raise some eyebrows, especially if we think that 100% of these events are 100% preventable. So quickly, uh, a little bit of the um, knowledge behind that. We, we talk about the fire triangle, which contains all the three issues that uh, cause us a fire. You need an oxidizer, you need an ignition source, and you need fuel. Now, everything will burn in oxygen, and I mean everything. So it this produces is only a slight glow. This is metal. But this when is a the steel wool. wool is placed in you the put oxygen, the steel wool in oxygen, the steel will burn. There's nothing left but rust at the end of that. Okay. This is a, a film from, you know, from the Royal Air Force looking at high oxygen environment in fighter jets and what happens to the fighter, the pilot's um, clothes. Again, note that little sign, 100% oxygen. This is <laughs> your patient under the drape. This happens so fast that it's hard to imagine how you can do anything good, but we'll learn that you can. Here's another example. Again, 100% oxygen, and you have an immediate fire that engulfs the entire patient. So a very potent environment for fire. And when you look at what happens when you, do, when you have an intubated patient, the flames and the smoke, that's the end of the tube that is in the lungs of the patient, okay? And you don't see it. But when that happens, that patient will be severely, have severe lung burns and tracheal burns that you can imagine by looking at that picture are gonna be deadly. So what do we do? When we are in a situation where there's a high risk for fire, we minimize the use of open O2. Don't use any oxygen supplementation. Consider intubation or protection of the airway on any case that you do in the head and neck. And of course, try to avoid anything that can cause ignition, like electrosurgical devices. Beware of the alcohol especially the pooled alcohol. And the problem is, once it starts burning, you, you actually don't see it because the flames are blue. I don't know if you if you ever uh, had something flambé in your restaurant. You know, they turn the light down so you can see the flames, so you feel like what you paid for is really, you can actually see. So today, this happens very often. How many people in this room have seen burns from a light source, or at least Everybody, right? Almost everybody. So be, th even though that <laughs> it's, it's hard to see sometimes, you don't pay attention, you know, you don't want this to happen to you just because you didn't turn the light off. Don't use any of these self-made devices around an electrosurgical pencil. It just is an accident ha happened to wait to, uh, waiting to happen. So again, Look what you're doing, look what happens where you're doing it, and then use the lowest possible setting on your electrosurgical device. Now people say you, you should, when, when a fire happens, the first, second, third, and fourth things you should do well. In fact, what we are saying today is it doesn't matter what you do first, but do these things fast. And that is stop the flow of all airway gases, extubate the patient, don't be afraid. It doesn't matter if he's under full uh, anesthesia. Get that tube out. Disconnect all the circuits. Rip everything off the patient as fast as you can. I don't care if it's burning already. To rip it down. S throw it in the, cor in the farthest corner you can from the patient away. And then extinguish the fire on the burning material and care for the patient. And it doesn't matter what you do first. If there's a small fire, just tap it out. Don't worry about your sterility, tap it out. 
And if it's a big fire, rip it off. Rarely you need this, but it would be nice if you knew where it is. So how many people in this room know where their fire extinguisher is in the, or there's gon they're gonna be in tomorrow? Okay, half the room. I don't happen to know, but it's good to know. And then you don't need to worry too much about that because regulations pred predict what this fire extinguisher is gonna be made of. Rescue, alert, confine, evacuate. So you rescue the patient, you alert nearby staff, you ins isolate the room, you close the doors, you shut off the walls, and you evacuate. This is, t you know, we talk about this, this is really very, very rare that you have to do that. There's only two known cases where actually entire surgical suite had to be shut down because of a fire. So most of the things we see you are in charge, you can change it, you need to react. You don't need the whole hospital to react. So take a team approach. There are some uh, risk assessment scores. If you, if you do mostly head and neck surgery, you should really know about those and assess your patient. Probably not if you do abdominal surgery or laparoscopic surgery, but there are risk assessment course that, uh, scores that you can integrate into your timeout if you feel necessary. It certainly would uh, inform the entire team. So for, to prevent this, discuss fire risk every time you, de you brief. Use wet sponges. Sterile water or saline should be available on your back table. They shouldn't have to run out to get it. And a syringe with saline on hand for oral procedures. So be prepared so that you can react very fast. And then again and again and again, use the lowest possible setting on your energy device. Don't do this. Be aware that you, know, you can cause a fire with a short circuit on any electrical machine that you use. Just to give you a little um, spiel how this would look like, uh, we, have a, we have made a nice For little a surgical video. setting, the three factors that must combine in order to generate a fire are spark, fuel source, and an oxidizer. This animation is a demonstration of a facial burn that occurred during a local anesthesia procedure on the face. Factors illustrated Temporal in this animation that promote fire risk are the closed tent effect of the large drapes creating an oxygen-rich environment about the patient's face, an opportunity for the oxygen to leak out under surgical field drape, the use of the higher voltage coagulation mode instead of cutting mode during coaptive coagulation of the vessel bleeding in the field, an unnecessarily high power setting on the ESU, activating the ESU prior to touching the forceps which created a spark. All of these factors can be minimized or eliminated in order to create a safer surgical environment. All members of the surgical team must remain vigilant to identify factors that contribute to the risk of surgical fire and be empowered to correct them. So the Sage's Fuse course and the Sage's Fuse material that's available online will teach you this. Again, I repeat myself, 100% preventable. Teamwork, communication before and after and during, education, risk assessment, and fire drills, and you will minimize that risk. There is a National Fire Protection Week every year in October. Here are some of the ways um, that they try to disseminate uh, prevention and awareness and make, y make your OR safe get fused, and with that, Thank you very much for listening.